Hello everyone, welcome to Policy Math. Today will be an introductory video for a subsequent video in the future involving the beta function, which is defined as follows. Beta of two variables x and y. Note this is the Greek letter capital beta, not a b, as gamma of x, gamma of y over gamma of x plus y, where of course this is the gamma function that extends the factorial function to non-integer arguments. And talk about the beta function, we're going to be multiplying two of the gamma functions as you can see here. And we're going to need a particular integral representation of the gamma function to do that. First, let's define the gamma function itself. Gamma of x is defined to be integral from zero to infinity with respect to some variable t from t to the x minus 1, e to the minus t. And if we do a substitution here, if we let a variable t go to 2t, not 2t, if we let a variable t go to t squared, well, we all of course have dt going to 2t dt of course, and thus integral just becomes twice integral from zero to infinity, since the limits don't change. And we have an extra factor of t here, and we have t squared here. t squared to the x minus one power is t to the two x minus two power, which we can rewrite as t to the two x minus one over t, and write that here. We see the, the e to the minus t becomes e to the minus t squared. A Gaussian now have these t's canceling out. Just becomes twice integral from zero to infinity dt t to the two x minus one e to the minus t squared. So note that we had originally a integer or arbitrary power of t multiplied by an exponential, we make this transformation and we have an odd power of a t multiplied by a Gaussian. Seemingly more complicated, but we're going to see that the symmetry properties of e to the minus t squared actually help us evaluate the beta function. We are going to find an integral representation of the beta function in terms of the trigonometric function, since we'll see it, it'll become useful in a following video. I just wanted to make sure that you knew where it comes from. Also, it's a pretty cool derivation by itself. So, hope you like it. We're going to start off by considering gamma of x times gamma of y. No, this is just a part of the beta function. And we'll see that we actually get a gamma x plus y at the end in terms of this integral representation. So just stick with me and you'll see how this relates to the beta function. Okay, if we do this, we now have, get my mic cord out of the way. Okay, we have two integrals. We're going to be using this one. Two integrals with two factors of two. So two squared is four. Four times the integral from zero to infinity. Uh, new variable s, we're going to have variables s and t here for our multivariable integral. And we're going to have s to the 2x minus 1, e to the minus s squared. We're going to have another integral with our variable t. And we're going to have t to the 2y minus 1, e to the minus t squared. Now some of you might see where we're going. When we combine the exponentials, we have s squared plus t squared, which invites us to use a polar coordinate transformation, which we're going to do now. after we write down explicitly our hunch here. So four, zero to infinity, and we got two of those. We have ds dt, and these bad boys don't change yet. S to the two x minus one, t to the two y minus one. But what's cool is we now have an e to the minus s squared plus t squared, as I said. Now we're gonna do the polar coordinate transformation. So if we let 
S to be our cosine of some angle theta, T to be our sine of some angle theta. Well, we know immediately that we can write ds dt as r dr d theta, and s squared plus t squared is equal to r squared. Now this may look slightly confusing since we're using s and t instead of x and y, but it's really the same thing. And we can continue, but I wanna stop and derive this for a moment since it's important to know where it comes from since you don't often derive it, you just use it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and derive it now. Feel free to head to skip a, a few minutes ahead if you don't wanna see it. Okay, so we have ds dt is going to be equal to the determinant in it, sorry, to the determinant of some matrix times dr d theta. And to find the matrix, we basically just wanna have the differentials cancel each other. So d s t by d r theta, sorry if that's a bit hard to read. And we're gonna call this thing j for future reference or j inverse, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. What does matter is in general, this is how you derive the Jacobian matrix, at least for a two by two transformation. We see the r's and theta's cancel out. That's how you can recall this. So j is just going to be ds by dr, which is cosine theta, and s by d theta, which is minus r sine theta. We have dr, sorry, dt by dr, which is going to be sine theta, and then dt by d theta, which is going to be our cosine theta. We take the determinant here, our cosine squared theta minus this, minus minus becomes plus, plus our sine squared theta, and we see that we can just take this, take this r and put it here, and this is one, so our j is indeed r, and we're good to go. Okay, carrying on with the main video, I just wanted to show you that because I like to remind myself about these simple things every once in a while, just so that you know why they're, why they're true, you're not just repeating things that you've memorized. Okay, polar coordinate transformation. So, so, we have this bad boy, just gonna be written as e to the minus r squared, the exponential term. And then we're gonna have this term here written as, well, s is r cosine theta, the two x minus one, and t is r sine theta, the two y minus one. So, this just becomes also, we have an extra factor of r out front because ds by t is r dr d theta. Okay, now this becomes r to the two x minus one plus two y minus one, and we get an additional minus one, no, plus one for this part and the cosines and sines are obvious, and this is just equal to r to the two x plus y minus one, since of course these bad boys cancel. And now we can write down the whole integral. Just keep this in your head, r squared x plus y minus one in, in your head for a bit. So our integral is now going to be, okay, we're gonna separate so we're gonna have the integral from zero to infinity. Sorry, it's a bit messy. Two, four, there's a factor of four out front. And the r variable, okay, that's what we have down here. So we have r to the two x plus y minus one. And we have our Gaussian. And now for the theta integral. Theta actually goes from zero to pi over two. Why does it go from zero to pi over two? Well, 
let's just look at the regions. We originally had a region with S and T where they both go from zero to infinity, as you see here. This corresponds to only the first quadrant. And if we write that in the R and theta plane, then the first quadrant actually corresponds to an angle of pi over two or a 90 degree angle. So that's why we don't go all the way around. We want to go from zero to infinity of both variables. Okay, sounds good. Okay, d theta, the cosines are pretty much the same. So we have cosine two x minus one of theta, sine of two y minus one theta, and we're pretty much done here. Why are we done? Well, if we look above here, we see that our r integral is exactly the form of a gamma function. Which gamma function is it? Well, we have x here. We're going to replace that with x plus y. We're all set. There's a factor of 4 here, which actually means it's going to be 2 times the gamma function, since the gamma function already has a factor of 2 in it. Okay, so now this is 2 gamma of x plus y. Now we have the same integral as before. Okay, fantastic. How does this tell us about the beta function? Well, we have gamma of x times gamma of y here, and we have gamma of x plus y here. So the beta function is defined as gamma of x times gamma of y over gamma of x plus y, which is exactly what we have here. So our beta function of x and y, which we originally defined as gamma of x, gamma of y over gamma of x plus y, we can now write in integral form as 2 times integral from 0 to pi over 2 d theta cosine 2x minus 1 theta sine 2y minus 1 theta. But Brandon, how does this help us evaluate the beta function? This integral looks pretty complicated. How does this help us at all? Well, Need some more room here. Okay, this helps us evaluate the beta function of some specific value. So let's say if we had x to be m plus one and y to be n plus one, where n and m are integers, the left-hand side actually becomes easy to evaluate. So we don't evaluate the beta function, but it helps us evaluate this integral. So if we do that, then the left-hand side becomes m factorial, n factorial, since we know that gamma of n plus 1 is simply n factorial, right? And the bottom becomes m plus n plus 1 factorial. Factorial. And we know that this is equal to our cosine integral, 2 times it, 2m plus 1 theta sine 2n plus 1 theta. So it basically tells us if we have an integral of the form of a cosine to an odd power times sine to an odd power, we can simply evaluate it immediately in terms of the factorials of the integers themselves. It's important that this be an integer, otherwise the argument won't work. But there are other ways to evaluate this if it's not an integer, which we may talk about in the future, and more importantly for, the, for one of the following videos, what if you didn't have the sine here? What if you only had the cosine of an odd thing integrated over pi over 2? Well, what we've just done here won't help you with that because we would need 2n plus 1 to be 0, which is not true, since 0 is not an odd number. It's actually an even number. It's the form 2n plus 1. So in the next video, or a next video, I'm not sure if I'll do it next, we're going to look at just the cosine piece, and we're going to use some other identities involving the gamma function, square roots of pi, and the beta function to investigate some interesting concepts.
And if you enjoyed this derivation and want to see more, please feel free to subscribe to my channel. See you next time.